everyone, I hope you're doing well, and of course Arnie does too. Before the human dominance on this planet, most extinctions were caused by either earth-altering events, changes in climate, or competition with other species. But today, the current rate of extinction is between a hundred and a thousand times higher than the pre-human background rate of extinction. This has led many scientists to claim that we are going through a sixth mass extinction event, and many species are struggling around the world. The reasons for these extinctions are pretty much the same as the pre-human dominance, but us humans are accelerating them. We increase the rate of climate change which can lead to natural disasters, and we destroy many habitats to make room for ourselves. In the past 500 years, invasive species have led to a third of all extinctions. When humans explored and conquered, we also brought a lot of animals along that we thought would be useful, such as cattle and sheep for farming, and cats and dogs as pets. These animals alone have led to many extinctions, with the domesticated cat alone being blamed for the global extinction of 33 species. Humans really have to be the worst invasive species, as we not only hunt and displace native species, but we also pollute their habitats. There are many famous animal extinctions that were caused by humans, such such as the dodo in 1690 and the Stella's sea cow in 1768. But there are many more recent extinctions and I'll be going through just a few of them today as I'll be going through five recently extinct species. And for our first species we'll be heading to North America as we have the passenger pigeon. This species mainly inhabited the deciduous forests of eastern North America but bred primarily around the Great Lakes. These pigeons migrated in enormous flocks constantly searching for food, shelter and breeding grounds. These birds mainly fed on beech nuts, acorns, chestnuts seeds and berries, but would also feed on worms and insects in the spring and summer. The males were slightly larger, reaching a maximum size of around 41 centimetres in length. Although they may resemble some plumper members of the pigeon family, these birds were built for speed. They were said to be graceful and highly manoeuvrable in the air, and were said to fly at speeds of around 60 miles per hour. One of the most shocking things about the passenger pigeon's extinction was just how many of them there were. They were once the most abundant bird in North America, numbering around 3 billion to 5 billion. These birds were hunted by the Native Americans, but this hunting had little effect on the population. It was only until the arrival of the Europeans in the 19th century that the passenger pigeons numbers really started to decline. Pigeon meat was commercialised as a cheap food, resulting in hunting on a massive scale. The last living passenger pigeon named Martha died in Cincinnati Zoo on September 1st, 1914. This just goes to show how destructive humans can really be, and is the most notable example of anthropogenic extinction. Although this was a very sad and depressing moment in history, some people are trying to bring the passenger pigeons back. The Great Passenger Pigeon Comeback, launched in 2012, aims to bring back the passenger pigeon using DNA of its closest relative. The aim is to clone these pigeons in captivity, and if the cloning is successful, to eventually release them into the wild. If this ambitious project was successful, it would bring back one of North America's most iconic birds. But for our next species, we'll be heading over to Australia, as we have the Phylacine. The Phylacine is known by many names, such as the Tasmanian Tiger and the Tasmanian Wolf. Although it was only found in Tasmania over over the later years of its reign. It was once found on the Australian mainland, and also New Guinea. Although it's been named after tigers and wolves, it's not related to either of them, and its closest living relatives are thought to be the Tasmanian devils. The thylacine was one of the most unique and interesting predators on this planet. It was a carnivorous marsupial, and the young would be carried in a pouch by their mothers. The male thylacines also had a pouch, and this acted as a protective sheath covering its external reproductive organs. The thylacines were apex predators, feeding on kangaroos, other marsupials, small rodents and birds, but this diet also landed them in a bit of trouble. Some of the reasons for their downfall are thought to be competition with the dingo, and also persecution from humans. When Europeans settled in Australia, they brought with them pets and livestock. Dogs were thought to have an impact on the abundance of their prey, and the thylacine also fed on the introduced livestock. This led to many humans viewing them as pests, and at one point there was even a bounty on their head. This was thought to be one of the main reasons behind their extinction, and the last wild thylacine was killed between 1910 and 19. In 1936, the last known thylacine named Benjamin died in captivity in a zoo in Hobart. This was just two months after the Australian government made the animal protective species, which just goes to show how slow the Australian government were to act. Although they are thought to be extinct for almost 90 years, there have been hundreds of apparent sightings. This has spurred an investigation into their current existence, but so far there is no credible evidence. There's also been attempts to clone this species, but so far the DNA has proven too poor to work with, so it really is a shame that we lost one of the most unique predators on this planet. But for our next species, we'll be heading back over to North America, as we have the Scioto Mad Tom. This small catfish was endemic to Ohio, and only one population was ever known. It was located in Big Darby Creek, a tributary of the Scioto River. Today, there are thought to be around 29 species of Mad Tom catfish, and they all have a very similar body shape and lifestyle. They have protective spines on their pectoral fin, which can 
cause pain and swelling if touched. These species are mostly nocturnal, coming out at night to feed on tadpoles and immature insects. They were declared extinct in 2013, but they had not been sighted since 1957. Nobody knows the exact reason behind their decline, but it's thought the modification of their habitat due down to siltation and industrial discharge and agricultural runoff were the main factors. As they had such a small population with only 18 fish ever being caught, the smallest environmental factors could have led to their extinction. But as they lived such a secretive nocturnal lifestyle, there could still be a few of them hiding out there. But for our next species, we'll be heading to the waters of the North Atlantic, as we have the Great Auk. This large flightless auk was the only modern species in its genus, Pinguinus. And yes, that's Pinguinus as in Pingu. Although they acted and looked very similar to penguins, they were not closely related to them. In fact, penguins were actually named after the Great Auk, as Europeans noted that they had a physical resemblance to the Great Auk. The Great Auk's closest living relative is the Razorbill, which can still be found in many parts of the North Atlantic. There's a reason this Auk had great in its name, as they were said to reach a size of around 85 centimetres or 33 inches long. It was usually found on rocky remote islands, with easy access to the ocean. This ocean provided them with food, as they were great swimmers and usually fed on fish. The Great Auk went extinct in the mid-19th century, mainly due down to hunting by humans and the way they reproduce. Great Auks mated for life, but the female would only lay one egg at a time. This meant that they were very vulnerable to predation and subsequently led to their decline. As the Great Auks were flightless and almost trusting of humans, they proved very easy birds to hunt and were eventually wiped out. There are once again attempts to de-extinct this species by combining its DNA with the genome of a razorbill, but unfortunately for now, this species is just for the history books. Before our final species, we'll move over to Africa, as we have the quagga. This strange equine animal looked like a mix between a zebra and a horse. It was endemic to South Africa, where it's usually found in arid to temperate grasslands. Today, there are three living species of zebra, and the quagga was thought to be a subspecies of the plain zebra. Although the quagga was unique among zebras, they were tragically unexplored and undervalued while they were still around. Only one living quagga was ever photographed, and this was a mare who lived in the London Zoo. Like their other family members, they were migratory grazers, feeding on a variety of grasses and shrubs. Although this species faced threats from many natural predators, the ones they really had to look out for were humans. For many years, they were hunted for their meat and skins, and were also frequently hunted for sport. These animals were not highly regarded by many people, and farmers saw them as a competition for their livestock. This hunting is the main reason behind their extinction, but again, some people are trying to bring them back. As they are so closely related to the plain zebra, it's thought that these zebras could be used for cloning, and some quagga-like zebras have been created through selective breeding. The zebras created by this selective breeding have less stripes and start to look a little like their extinct relatives. So once again, this animal goes down as another species we've driven to extinction through hunting. But that's about it for this video. There are many more animals that could be on this list, so if you want a part two, then let me know down in the comments below. But thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.